We're going to get started. Uh, Rochelle's going to kind of pick up where she left off last time. And of course, if you have questions, please feel free to drop them in. Um, and we're, ha we're happy to try to get those questions answered. So without further ado, here is Miss Rochelle Isaacson. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Don, for letting me do this again and finish what I started. Um, so like Don said, last time I kind of covered like the foundations and the basics of trumpet. Uh, that's the most important part. Um, I kind of referred playing an instrument to building a house. Uh, the foundation is what comes first and then kind of all the boring stuff. The, the walls, the pipes, it's really not pretty. I always tell my kids at school when they come in and they wanna play on the very first day or the first week, I tell them, you know, when you buy a new house, you can't go out and buy the new TV to hang on the wall because you don't have a wall. I said, you gotta wait a little bit to get there. So uh, where we left off last time was kind of like right as we were getting to the walls and the pipes and kind of the fun stuff. So I'm gonna pick up right about where my kids will start actually playing on the trumpet. So. Here's my little screen. I hope y'all can see that just fine. Um, so trumpet time. Um, and I think I told you about this last time. So all of my kids get this handout from Band Directors Talk Shop. Um, it's a really cool resource. They have it for all the instruments. And it's a really cool, colorful page. And it gives them like step by step on how to care for their instruments. And we do kumbaya circles. So we'll have like picnic time. And we'll grab our instruments and our valve oil and our napkins. And we'll sit in a big circle. I'll sit in the middle. And I'll be very specific with them about how to oil their valves, how to grease their slides. And we'll learn all of that before we really start moving buttons too much. We'll sometimes push valves and buttons before then, but then all the kids will, you know, they'll raise their hand, my button's sticking or this feels weird. So I usually do the oiling before we get too much into positions and things. Um, our kids have to earn their instrument by learning the parts. So we'll do like touch and tell. So we'll open our cases and then we'll we'll touch and tell. So I'll hold up my trumpet and I'll say, well, what's this called? And they'll go, it's a lead pipe. And then I'll explain how the trumpet works. Um, and we'll do, you know, trumpet party tricks. And we'll do things where we're just talking about how you don't necessarily have to make the trumpet make the sound. You just have to get the air moving. Um, so we we learn all the parts. We learn what they are. We, we wiggle the fingers in the case. Um, but they have to know what that is and the real names of them. So we do all of that before we play. Um, when we start playing or taking the instrument out of the case, we do, um, we talk about hand position. I think I told you this last time, left hand holds, right hand is on top. Definitely no pinky in the ring. Um, I have not had very much success with kids that have pinkies in the ring. Um, they usually have really crummy technique. Um, and I would much rather them just develop really great technique now. So I'm kind of a turd about that. I don't know if I can say turd on here. Can I say turd? Hey, uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I Fine. officially said it four times. So um, there you go. Um, so no pinkies in the hook. And I, I'm, again, a turd about it. Um, so I do all my brass. I teach seven positions. Um, so first position is open and second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven. And we can talk about that more later. But I teach that. It's been a game changer in my teaching. It's been a game changer for the people I work with as well. I know that it's easier for them because they just have to say, hey, brass, it's fifth position instead of trying to give a long explanation to everyone what that means. Um, so we do that and we'll we'll play games. So I'll have them put their instrument on their chin and I'll say, show me one. And oh, I guess I'll do it this way. Okay, show me one. And I'm like, good, you did it. And you know, even the kid who doesn't know what he's doing, he's got it right. And I'm like, okay, now show me two and I'll do it. Show me one, show me two, show me one, show me two. And then we'll just play games going back and forth. I'll say, show me one, show me two, show me three. And sometimes I'll go fast. Sometimes I, I don't even care if some kids are doing it right. I'll pick that one kid who's struggling between third position because for some reason you say third position and they wanna use this finger. So I'll pick one or two kids in the room that I know are struggling with their positions and I'll just eye them but the rest of the kids are doing it too. And I'll be shouting out numbers, one, two, three. And we'll play those position games. Um, and then I also will teach them some rote songs with that. So, you know, um, I think I said this last time, we'll, we'll do um, one, two, three. And then they feel like they played a song. And for your go-getter kids, they might learn how to play Let's Go Band. One, four, three, two, one. And it might sound terrible, but they feel like they've done something and they're teaching themselves positions while they're at home. So this is from the Musical Mastery, which I referenced the last time. They're amazing and wonderful. If you haven't checked them out, you need to. They're fabulous, especially for young teachers. I forgot to show you all this, but they have a, um, like a resource guide. 
and I bought it. It's got all the books in there for every brass instrument, and they have one for woodwinds as well. There's no percussion books because um, there's plenty of books that do that already. But each of the books have like really specific like points. And I know you can't really read that, but specific points for each exercise. Um, and it'll give you ideas. And I think it's really great for young teachers or maybe somebody who's not teaching an instrument that they're super comfortable teaching. Um, so this is out of that book and they have the answers on one guide and then the quiz. And so this is the quiz and this is what my kids will fill out. And that's what they have to get a hundred on in order to earn their trumpet. And then this is their position quiz. So they fill that in. Sometimes I'll give them a grade for it. Sometimes we won't. But that's really handy for us. Love it. It's wonderful. Um, so when we're playing the trumpet, we spend a lot of time just doing I play, you play, and we do highs and lows, which are G's and C's. Um, and my main goal is to get everybody on a G. If you are focusing on everyone getting a C first, you're going to struggle. So I prefer the struggle to be early on when everyone's kind of struggling. So my goal is to get everyone on a G. Uh, so we'll put on a harmony director or I'll walk around with my trumpet. Um, I sing a lot to them. I'll sing key or high note is what I'll tell them before they know note names. I'll tell them high note and then they'll play back to me and I'll say low note. And then we'll go down the row and I'll say like, I'll pick a note for the kids and I'll say, okay, I want you to play me a high note. And then they have to play me a high note and a low note. And so if a kid struggles, I can you know, I kind of stick with them a little bit and I'll go, no, I said, play me a high note. That's a low note. I want a high note. And I'll kind of be silly about it. And, and I'll kind of give them pointers, but I do it really fast. And I can see like, Hey, those three kids are struggling with high notes. So I know to kind of pick on them a little bit more, but in a nice way. Um, so we do that a lot. Yeah. Some of the common things you see with kids who aren't able to get from the C to the G, like they're just stuck on C. Yeah, so a lot of kids like naturally like C is going to be a, like their money note. Every kid is every kid should be able to get a C in your trumpet class. Um, if they're stuck on C, that's when I would I would kind of stick with the kid a lot, and I would I ask them, okay, so what what do you have to do to go higher? Well, I'll ask, first ask them like, are you too low or too high? And they'll tell me uh, I'm too low. Hopefully they can hear that, and then I'll tell them, okay, what what are the three things that you need to do to go higher? And they'll tell me firm lips and I'll go okay put your finger here is it firm and I'll, I'll remind them we do a lot in the beginning um and I found this out later in my career firm lips a lot of kids will squish their lips together I don't know if y'all can see me but they'll squish their lips together like this because it feels firm like if you do that with your face and you kind of make like a kissy face your muscles feel like they're working hard um and so they some kids will do this but the center is super mushy still so I, I make them realize that. I'm like, this is not firm. It feels like your muscles are firm, but they're not. Firm is going to be flat up against your teeth. So I tell them to hug your teeth, like kind of aim for this over here. And then I always tell them, keep the wet part inside, inside. Students that have larger bottom lips, they just, I tell them like, roll it in. And sometimes like I'll tell the other kids like earmuffs. And I'll tell that one kid, I'm like, roll it all in, roll it in. And then they'll play and they'll play like a way higher note. Or sometimes they'll just go to G and I'll get way excited. And I'm like, see, you went higher, you went higher. And then they go, oh, okay. And the kids kind of have to figure out how their own faces work. Um, so sometimes going to the extreme and telling them to roll it in and make their lips go away and then blow, your kids, you'll see that their their lips will naturally relax. They'll get a high note for a second and then fall to a low note. Um, but I wouldn't fuss too much. So we spend a lot of time just trying to get kids on G. Um, and that's it's going to be the vast majority of your time at the beginning is just getting kids to play G. Um, you can try some tricks. So playing the pipe is something that's fabulous to do. And I referenced this last time. So playing the pipe, you'll take your tuning slide off. Uh, when you play this, it plays a, a concert E flat. So it sounds like this. So It, this will make E pop out really good. So you get, if you play you play F or E, you can even tell them like, hey, okay, now push down third position. Now we're gonna play. When you put this back in, they should all be able to play F. And then they're closer to G. Um, so that's, that's a way to work up to G. But if I'm being honest, most of the time I just spend in first position, um, forcing them to get used to playing high and low. Um, we'll do long tones playing just eight full counts, 
we usually do eight counts. I don't, I very rarely do four counts. Um, and I do not tell them to play quiet. Like we play loud all the time. Um, I want them to blow. Um, most of the trouble with brass instruments is airflow or just like lack of muscle strength or like being familiar with your face. So like I blow, I really don't talk about dynamics like ever um, in first year band. Like sometimes I might say, hey, play softer. And a kid might ask me how to do that. And I don't, I, I refer to it like on a number system, like on a scale from like two to 10, but uh, we don't really talk about playing soft. We just, we blow um, all the time. So, and then I talked about BSOTB last time. I'll talk about that more in a second, um, but we add positions as we go. So I'll play, I'll play. So demonstration, I'll do this. And the middle act like that. And then I'll play. Middle act like that. And then I'll go. And 95% of them will go, oh, and they'll push down the button. And then we'll go, da, da, and then we'll start doing less words. You know, and then some kids aren't paying attention and I snap and get them back on it. But I do it all rote at the beginning. All of my lip slurs are all rote. So, and I always go high to low first. Um, so that's how I, I play, you play, and I add in positions as I go. I, I stay usually like one, two, and three for a really long time. I'll sometimes go to five, but when you add this finger, this is the special finger um, for your hand. I don't know why, but the third finger is very special when it comes to trumpet players. So when you add this one, something, something happens. Your fist firing um, in the brain. So this one takes a lot more love. So fifth, sixth, and seventh position, um, I do a little later. Um, so that's kind of the thing we do. Um, and I showed you my little practice things that I sent home with them. They get little uh, silly little things to take home to practice their instrument. Um, but it's all about not like enforcing no bad sounds. Beginners will sometimes, after they know how to make sounds, will like to play bad sounds. And I, I nip it in the bud quickly. I'll tell them, no, 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 we don't do that here. Um, you know, we don't giggle about it because kids will laugh and I'll, I'll get very serious. And I'm not a very serious person very often. And I'll get very serious. I'm like, oh, no, 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 we don't do that. We don't make bad sounds. Um, in terms of practicing, when they start taking their instruments home, I... I am a very strong believer in small practice sessions. I would love for my children to practice 30 to 45 minutes a day, but as a brass teacher, I find that my kids don't, like they're busy with other things. And maybe, I mean, I'm sure woodwind players are as well, but I don't know, like my brass players are really flaky when it comes to practice sometimes. So I'll tell them, I'm like, five minutes is all I want. And they're like, well, I could do five minutes. And I'm like, I know you can do five minutes. And I always tell them like, look, some of you spend more time in the bathroom than that. And then they giggle. And I'm like, but really? Um, I said five to 10 minutes. Because what'll happen is they'll usually practice more than that anyway. Um, and I'll tell them, you know what? I don't want you to practice 30 minutes straight. I want you to practice for five minutes. Then go get a snack, watch TV. Then come back, practice five more minutes. And then go watch some more TV, do some homework. And then, you know, right before bed, five more minutes. And I said, look at that. You practiced 15 minutes today. And it was only five minutes at a time. So I think little increments makes the kids feel much more successful and you'll get more bang for your buck. So articulation, um, we do all of that stuff that I mentioned before without ever addressing the tongue. And then I'll, I'll slowly start asking them questions. I love to guide their learning. Um, and I, I do it a lot question-based. So I'll say, well, you know what? We've been playing really long notes. I said, what if, what if I wanted to play two Gs in a row? And then some kid will say, well, you should just do this. And they'll try to demonstrate it for me or, you know, and I make them, I make them try to think of it. And there's always a kid who will go, oh, you should use your tongue. Sometimes I have to guide them a little bit, but I say, yeah, we use our tongue. And then I'll, I'll say, you know, say two, which I know we've all done this, you know, and they'll say two and they say, they say two, two. And then we say two, 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 two. And we're just silly for a little bit. Um, and then when we actually start doing it on trumpet, we do who twos. So we'll start and we'll go who two. And I'll ask him to do that. Who to? Kind of like you're saying at you, but you're saying who to? And then we'll go who to? And we'll do it faster. And then we eventually we'll make the who shorter and the two longer. So instead of going who to, we go who to? 
And so you're slowly taking away the who. And then I'll tell them, okay, now just go two. And it usually works really well. Kids can catch on really quick. There are always a few kids every year that just don't understand how to tongue. And young teachers especially need to familiarize yourself with what it sounds like when they tongue incorrectly. When they go poo, 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 poo. Um, there's some kids that can get away with poo poo into their instrument for a long time. Um, but it's obvious. So jaw motion, any pooing or hooing or stopping their air, tongue stop. And again, I do this by demoing for them. I'll play it for them and I'll say, look, doesn't that sound silly? Oh yeah, it does. Or I'll say, which one sounds better, one or two? And I'll do a poo and a two. Um, and so we'll do that a lot. And then that's when we play the pipe a lot because um, that's when air direction starts to go down the drain in trumpet world. So when you're playing the pipe, you want there to be constant and steady. And when you play the tight, what do you want that? When you start turning, the kids kind of want to start moving their air and their tongue. You might hear this. <laughs> kind of sounds like it's pooping. You don't want that when they play. You want them to play straight. <laughs> I love these because you don't have to learn how to play. All tongues can do is feel like we're going to play through the pipe. And the kids can sit down and do it fine. And then we'll go down the row and we'll go don't drop the baby style. And, you know, I'll let each kid do their own rhythm. And you're in, you're, you're, um, you're getting to evaluate their tonguing. And you can hear instantly who's hooing, who's pooing, who has no clue how to use their tongue whatsoever. Um, so, Playing the pipe is great because they don't have to worry. You don't have to necessarily worry about what note is coming out because the majority of your class are going to get the right pitch. You are going to hear those kids that are flat. It's very rare that a kid is above the pitch on the pipe. Um, it's very hard to do to play sharp on the pipe. Um, and it's very natural when you're listening to a drone to bring your pitch down. So it's really great for those kids that play too tight. Um, and then it's it's good for the other kids to kind of hear. And you can tell them, like, blow your air faster. And then they can hear the pitch go up. Um, so I think it's one of the best things to practice articulation with. I'll also throw in some flutter tongues occasionally. That's just, like, my own personal favorite thing to do. And I'll always do it at the end. And the kids are like, whoa, you're like a superwoman. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Um, and then one kid will go home and figure out how I did it. And then I'll no longer be that cool anymore. But it's okay. Um, and then... Once we do that, we'll we'll change articulate. I'll, I'll like I'll do I play you play, but I'll change notes. Now we'll go high 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 low low high low low high, and I'll I'll give them a workout basically. And we're building muscle strength. We'll hold our instrument up, and we'll do it a lot. I mean, I would say we'll do it for you know two or three minutes, and then we'll pause. And I tell them you can't put your trumpet down until I put my trumpet down. And then I walk around the room while I'm doing that, and I'm fixing faces. I'm flicking pinkies. I'm, I'm like a little trumpet ninja in there. Um, and then this is great. Somebody gave me this idea years ago, and I can't remember who it was, but they take their rhythm sheets when they're doing, usually at this time they're doing quarter notes and half notes. Um, you take your rhythm sheets and you have them play pitches based on what note value it is. So you say, okay, when you see a black note, I want you to play a high note. And when you see the white note, I want you to play a low note. And you can do that. Um, so now they're getting rhythm practice and it's, causing the brains of some of your really smart kids to work really hard. Hey, Rochelle. Yeah. When you're doing the, the B flat and F, or concert B flat, concert F, yeah. feel, are you specifically looking for B flat and F at first, or are you just trying to see if they can go high and low? Um, I want them to go high and low. And I mean, the way the parcels work out on the trumpet, the, the, they're going to do that. Now, some kids, there's going to be I've, I've had one every year who's like the screamer in the class. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. The kid who's like freakishly high all the time. And you're like, baby, come down, come out of the scream sphere. You're going to be amazing later. Um, so I like, I'll kind of, I'm kind of guiding them to get to G and C um, or concert, concert B flat. I'm trying to guide them to those notes. Um, when we first start, I really just want high and low, but when we're on the trumpet, I'm, I'm trying to slot them in those and I'll put a drone on and I'll just do the, the G and the C and I'll just, drone it and eventually they just kind of learn what those notes are and those are our money notes um i talked about best sound of the day last time because i felt like it's really important um best sound of the day is our thing like we started doing it years ago and it's like 
our kids love it. Like they get mad at me if I don't do best sound of the day. And I really don't understand why. Um, but they, they love feeling special. They love showing off. They love showing that they've improved. Um, and as the year goes on, I pick more and more complicated notes. Um, my co-teacher, uh, Lisa James, she's a woodwind player and she does best sound of the day, but sometimes she'll do it over like a finger pattern while they'll have to do like four or five notes. I always do long tones. Sometimes when my, like one year I had this trumpet class and like they were really good and it was, it was scary. So I like threw an articulation one time and I would make them tongue like four quarter notes and then a whole note. Um, but that's about as risky as I've gotten. And so we'll just hold out a note for eight count and we'll go around the room. Everyone will play. And then we'll talk about sounds and we'll talk about our favorites and our not favorites. And I'll, you know, like some kid will raise his hand and say, well, I really like Joseph. And I'm like, well, Joseph is great, but he stopped the note with his tongue. So he loses. And then he's like, oh, well, guess what? Joseph's going to go home and practice not stopping with his tongue. Because for some reason, he really wants an I Love Band sticker. Um, and the winner gets an I Love Band sticker. And we just buy like a big old roll of them and we rip them off. And we, you know, we hand it to the kid and we tell him. Uh, give them a one clap and we go one, two, three, clap. And we clap for our kid and they put their Isla Band sticker on their binder. And we tell them to keep them. And at the end of the year, the kid who has the most Isla Band stickers wins some money. And to be honest, we have never actually given any money because like we always forget or like coronavirus or something. So <laughs> there's these kids and they're, you know, they're, they're like, how many do you have? You have eight? Oh, you know, and so they look love collecting the Isla Band stickers. My favorite thing about this is the kid who never gets an Isla Band sticker. And then one day he plays and he wins and he goes, oh, that's my first sticker. And I'm like, and then everyone celebrates him and he's so excited. Um, so the cool thing about the person who wins, they get to be the leader of the day. And so when we do long tones or we do, I play, you play, I let him play or her play. And then I copy and usually it's a great way for me to see like, Hey, that kid's a super leader or like, you know, that kid's on the right track, but like, gets really nervous. Um, you can kind of figure out who, who's got it, who doesn't have it. Um, so my kids love being the leader. They love that type of stuff. So, um, like as down here, it says, who's, who's the winner. The winner is big, confident sound, a steady centered tone. We, I put a drone on. Uh, later in the year, we will add the tuner and I'll put tonal energy on the board and I'll walk around and you can, I love it because you can see the kids while they're playing, they got eight counts and you can see them and hear them trying to adjust. Um, and it's teaching them to tune without really getting into the specifics of it. We'll talk about it a little bit, like what this means and what this means. Um, but it's, it's my favorite. I really do love it. Um, I, all of my beginners love that. And then some samples of what we do. So um, on that, this side over here, I can't see my mouse, but on that side over there, that's uh, it's just very beginning, basic sounds. These come from musical mastery again. Um, it says air and sound. So when we first start, they'll blow air only, and then we'll add sound. And these have notes written on pitch. I don't really follow it. I kind of do whatever I want. Um, and then first notes, as usual. Um, first notes, this is again, a whole note followed by rest. When we do this page, we do one, three, five, seven, nine first, which is all the whole note lines. Um, and that way they're playing and they're holding one position down the whole time and they're not having to change between. And then once we add articulation, we'll, we'll go back and we'll go, well, let's do two, four, six, eight, ten. 10. Um, and then we'll do 11 at the bottom. And then sometimes we'll read 11 backwards and then we'll play, you know what, let's play 11, but let's play it in half notes this time. Um, so we, we like to do that and it starts really slow and simple and we play this for a while. And then flexibility and slurs. Uh, it's like a huge thing for brass players. You gotta do it a lot in the beginning. It's building their muscles and their strength. And like I told you, uh, I teach all my slurs rote at first. They, they don't know enough notes to read it or understand it. Like they might, they might get G to C, but when you start adding sharps and in harmonics, some of the kids start asking really hard questions. And we just don't talk about it. I just play and I'm, I just hold up my fingers. One, two, three. And that's why positions are awesome because you can be playing your instrument or dealing with a kid and you can just hold up numbers and the kids are engaged and they're watching you, but they're also playing your instrument. Um, we do E to A. Um, there are schools of thoughts of like changing the position of your air or the direction you blow your air. I have never really gotten that or like 
I understood it. I don't know. I, I as a trumpet player myself, I never really thought of my air changing directions. And it's probably the way I was taught in the beginning. Um, but we do eat all, all vowel changing, um, focusing on keeping your head still, no ducking of your head, no, no downward trumpet, no pressure on the top lip. Um, and then I teach my kids, my beginners, uh, these slide adjustments for sixth and seventh position. So for those of you that don't know, um, trumpet sixth position is very, very sharp. So you have to elongate the instrument to fix it. So you have to kick your slide. For all the notes that are played like this, especially alternate positions, except for the lowest partial, low G. And same thing with seventh position, you got to kick this out even further. You can cheat if you have little hands or a little handed trumpet players, you can have them kick their first slide and their third at the same time. Um, beginner trumpets are pretty terrible. And sometimes these slides don't work well, but teach them to go through the motions anyways. Like tell them kick, because when they get a big kid trumpet, they're going to be like, oh, this works really great. Um, and it's better to fix it and have to come in some than have to learn how to kick it out. Um, so we learn, <laughs> so we learn, uh, we learn how to do our slide adjustment. So when they do high, low, they kick their slide in. And so I'll walk around and I'll tell them out, in. Um, and then when we get more complicated, I'll tell them out, in, out, in, in out. Um, so I teach them those things because they're big enough to do that, like they can handle it. Um, these examples here are the Bugles 2, which is like a more graduated version. Um, if you look at Bugles 2, line 2, you'll see that it starts on a C. And then it goes C to D. And that is super scary to me. As a trumpet player trying to teach these kids, um, I go backwards on this. So we start in seventh position. And we go seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And I build them up to C. So like in the fall semester when we're doing lip slurs and I feel like they're they're getting an understanding of how to change between the high and the low without tonguing, um, I'll add this, but we'll go backwards and we'll just go seven and we'll go six and then we'll go five and then we'll go four and then I'll stop. And then the next day I'll add three and then the next day I'll add two and one. Um, so I, I always go backwards on these. Um, I, I very rarely start on C in the fall semester. And then Bugles 3, this is definitely like we hadn't gotten to Bugles 3 um, before the great Corona event. So um, we're getting there. But that this one I play backwards as well. I mm -hmm. always start on seven and work my boy back up. And I always do I play, you play. I start on the partial and I go backwards. Um, if you can't play, then do a drone. And, and all of my lip are always done with drones as well. It helps them center their pitch. It gives them a target to aim for. Um, and it really does train their ears up. Um, for technique, teaching them technique. So I think technique can go lots of ways. Like you have super simple basic technique, which is the finger wiggle, teaching them to push their buttons straight up and straight down. If you're not careful, my trumpet won't do it so much, but I could get one of those like Yamaha trumpets to do it in a heartbeat. If you don't push your valve straight up and straight down, you don't push it straight up and straight down. If you push it like inward or like slightly diagonal, it'll stick. I don't know if you can tell, but it's a little sticky. But those little Yamaha trumpets or like the beginner trumpets that your kids are playing on, if they push like diagonally, like if they push like this direction, it will stick every single time. And then they'll be bugging you. And you gotta teach them straight up and straight down. So like from this knuckle down here, like, you know, the, the, the punch and knuckles, not these knuckles up here. Um, so teaching them that technique on finger wiggles, and then getting more basic. Um, so this says like trumpet basics number one. This is going from a C to a D. So you're going from first position to sixth position. So they have to move three things. They have to move their first, third, and their kick slide all at the same time. So I love this exercise. And I used to do this with my kids, um, but Musical Mastery has written it out in such a beautiful way. Um, and it has all the slide markings for you. It tells you when they should kick their slides out. Um, and so they practice going from C to D, which is a big one. That's a huge deal. And then they survive and then you, they get to rest and then they go D to E and in between the rest, they're holding their fingers still. So they're not worrying about moving in the rest. And then they're going E to F and then they're holding still and then F to G. So now we're building technique. We're also building endurance because we're doing this um, all the way up to G now. Miss so, Isaac. Yeah. When your kids are playing, do you insist that they play uh, with their fingertips, or what do you, what do you, how do you tell them to play 
I tell them to use the fat part of the fingers like our woodwind friends do. Like I tell them the uh, fingerprint on the valve. So like, I mean, that's how I do it. Like if you're gonna pick up a pencil or something, you're gonna pick it up like that, right? So I tell them some should be on the lead pipe and then your your um, button should come down towards that. So fingerprint. I don't do fingernails, like I'm a girl. So, you know, you, you don't wanna break a nail or anything. Um, but. <laughs> So I use I use the pad of the finger. So not like not like this. I see kids play like this and it like hurts my, my feelings. So um slightly flat. I tell them like you're eating a cheeseburger, you don't want to crush it. Uh you don't want to like put your nails in there because that's weird. Um that's like cat scratches. Um so we'll do that technique for a while. Um it says on here isolate trickier combinations like four to six and six to one. Um so four would be first and second valve going to six. That's tricky. Um practicing doing that on the trumpet, making sure that their fingers aren't like flying away crazy. And, you know, like tell them like, don't let your middle finger come off. Uh, you don't want to flip the bird to anyone. Yeah. And then like <laughs> pinky. So when I do that, like my pinky is not anywhere near the trumpet. So if your pinky's in the ring, that, that, the pinky is, is very uh, connected to your third finger. So when you start moving that, if you're hooked in here, you're just inhibiting like all kinds of issues. Um, and then when you're doing the technique stuff, uh, I don't use my tongue or I don't do tongue and the musical mastery book doesn't either. That's why I love it so much. So it's doing all the technique stuff, all the button moving, but it's all airflow and fingers. Um, and so you'll see, so it starts basics one and then it moves down C to F and F to E and it goes scale based. And then it adds three notes. Ba, da, da. So now they're having to go eight counts with their air and I'll tell the kids, I'm like, okay, what's different about number three? And they'll tell me, oh, it's three notes. Oh, well, how long does your air have to last? <gasps> Eight counts. So like we talk about all of that. Um, and then on the very bottom of the page, it does a scale, C, D, E, F, G, or a little mini scale. Um, and then basics two, we get to that pretty quickly. Um, and then it starts moving chromatically. I'm a big chromatic fan. I know that some people are not a fan of moving chromatically, but I love it, especially because I teach position. And I'll, t I'll tell my kids, like when we start adding flats and sharps, we'll talk about the theory, obviously. And I'll say, well, what does a flat do to a note? And I'll tell them it lowers it by a half step. And we'll talk about what a half step is. And then I'll tell them, well, guess what? On trumpet, going from first position to second position, that's a half step. And they're like, oh. So I'll say, okay, well, what position is G? And they'll say, well, that's first position. I'm like, great. So I said, what's the name of the next note? And they'll go, well, it's a G flat. And I said, well, what does the flat do? Well, it lowers it a half step. I said, okay, well, who knows the fingering for G flat? And they'll go, is it second? And I'll go, it is second. And so the kids are figuring out the theory behind why it is what it is. Um, so we teach them all that. Now going up doesn't really work so well because they don't understand that G to G sharp is a half step, but going down, it works perfectly. Uh, it works really well with my French horns as well. They, they seem to catch on really fast. Um, so we'll talk about that and we'll do chromatics. And this is when I'll do a lot of the I play, you play, or the kids will be the leaders and they'll play G. And then where it has the rest, the kids will echo back. And then G flat, G flat, F, F. And we'll go back and forth like that, focusing on starting with our tongue, stopping with air, um, playing with a big salt, like a big solid sound the whole time. And then line two on this goes the same thing, but now it puts the notes back to back. So now you're going G, da, rest, 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 da, da. And then three puts it together. And then four does it. And then if you'll notice on four at the end, it goes up in sharps. Usually for a long time, we'll just go down. And then when we start talking about sharps, because we don't really talk about sharps very much until later. When we add sharps, then we'll add those back in. Um, and then at the very like, bottom corner over here where it says trumpet technique. These are um, in the musical mastery as well. And they're like mini Clark's uh, Clark studies. I'm a big fan of Clark studies. Um, they helped me a lot with my technique, like all the way through school. Um, and I love this, that it writes it out really slow and I'll teach them a Clark study really quick in the fall. And we'll do it two measures at a time, three measures at a time. And we'll do it nice and slow. Um, so it's, it's very helpful for us. We may not do line two right away because it goes faster, but I'll teach them um, a Clark study. I don't teach them a lot. I'll teach them the easy ones, the, just to get their fingers moving and to push them. So range, like the big elephant in the room. How do you play higher? How do you teach your kids to play higher? Um, so with my kids, I am very sneakily, we buzz every day. So at the beginning of class, we use our burps 
and we'll buzz. Um, and I, I think I told y'all last time that we do like buzz patterns, mini scale. So we'll go. Uh, we'll go up and down. And then I'll pick it up. And then I'll go. Uh, and I'll just buzz or, you know, and then I'll, I'll make them go up and then I'll say, well, buzz me this note. And they'll buzz it and I'll go, buzz me this note. And I'll just keep adding a note every day and their eyes get bigger. They don't know what notes I'm pushing on the keyboard, but I'll play little mini scales and I'll just keep pushing them up and up. And in my brain, I'm thinking, hmm, most of the class was hitting a concert B flat there. It might be time to start playing that on the trumpet. So, I don't introduce a note on the trumpet until I've very sneakily been buzzing up there for a week or two. Um, and then as we as we push even higher above C, same thing. And I'll just, I'll, I'll sit there and listen and I'll remind the kids like, blow, blow, blow. Because when they're on the mouthpiece, sometimes kids don't realize that they're hitting it or that they're not hitting it. And they don't give up. They keep blowing, which is a big part of playing high notes. It's just not to give up. But when they're playing the trumpet, it's really obvious that you're not hitting that note. And then some kids get discouraged and they stop playing. Or the opposite, they play so loud that you can't hear anybody else. Um, so we buzz it before we ever play it. And then um, we do flow studies and then the chromatic to build up. So uh, flow studies, just like uh, the Chicka website you guys might be familiar with, but it's uh, da, 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 da. And I'll show you an example. It's just going up to a note, and we'll start with A, and we'll hold it out, and then we'll stop, and then we'll take a breath, and then we'll go to the next one. Um, we also move chromatically up, so we'll start on whatever note we're most comfortable with. So we'll start on maybe, let's say it's C, because say we're rock stars. We start on C, and we want to work our way up to D. So we'll go C, and I'll go to C sharp, and we'll hold it, and I'll, like, I'll be all dramatic, and I'll go C sharp, and they'll play really loud, and then we'll stop. And then we'll go, okay, let's go on. And then we'll go C sharp and then we'll go to D. And it's really, I'm just having them play and hold it out and go for it. Um, so we, we just keep building it up, but we go one note past where most of the class can go every day. So if the majority of the class is hitting a C, we totally go to a C sharp. And if most of them can hit that, then we go up one more. Um, I usually stop <laughs> when it sounds really bad. Um, and with high notes, I think you have to get yourself accustomed to bad sounds. And I mean, I don't mean, I don't mean bad tone quality. I mean, just like they're, they're not on the right pitch or the right partial. Um, some kids are going to try really hard. So they just have to keep blowing. Uh, I put in here going from C to D, uh, concert B flat to concert C is, is really tricky for me. And I find that it's tricky for my beginners. It, it feels like a really big skip. For them and it takes some time and some practice sometimes that's going to be the hardest gap for your kids to go c c sharp to d and you got to spend a lot of time in there and they have to be kind of uncomfortable um being very vulnerable so that they can grow through that and i always tell the kids i'm like okay now like you have to practice these all the time you have to go home and torture your, your brother torture your sister and you know, like go go make them wonder who died in the room because you got to go make some sound um, but so we do lots of fermatas, lots of expanding tones, and I tell them just keep blowing, just keep blowing, keep your lips set and keep your air going. Um, if your muscles aren't set correctly and your air is not working, it's not going to happen. Um, so I'm just very positive, especially with your braces, friends. Let's we'll talk about it a second. But I just I'm very positive and just excited, and we celebrate the smallest victories. You're going to have kids in the room that can squeak out high notes all day, and I really. I don't, I don't give them the time of day. I'm like, cool, awesome, all right. And like, I will celebrate a kid going from a C to a C sharp that was struggling more than all, you know, a kid who's screaming, um, just because that takes a lot of work. And it's just, it's just getting your face accustomed to what it's got to do. And it's individual for each kid. Um, and then I put braces and other issues. Um, the bottom lip is what controls the register. The bottom lip controls the register. So if your kid's too low, you need to address the bottom lip. Now, it may, that's, I mean, kind of a, a broad idea, but I feel like that's a, that's a good starting point. You're too low, your bottom lip isn't firm enough, it isn't flat enough, it isn't uh, rolled in enough, whatever it is that you need to do based on your own like physical attributes. Um, for braces, I think brace guards, it's literally called guards, I'm sorry, and wax are helpful. 
I, I never had braces as a kid. Um, I, I tell the kids, I'm like, I'm bracist. And they're like, Miss Isaacson. And I'm like, I am. I, I'm against braces. I'm like, crooked teeth for life, okay? Um, but some kids, like 12 to 15 is like brace time. And that's when they get it. So like the brace guards, um, the Morgan bumper company, I will like stock up on those at CMEA or I'll ask for samples and I keep them in my drawer and I'll give them to those kids. Um, they'll try it. Wax works sometimes, but I just tell the kids, I'm like, when you bleed, stop. And then they giggle and I'm like, no, we're really like, you got to build up calluses. You got to keep going. And I, again, I'm just really positive with them. And I'm like, you do you, it's going to happen. You're not going to have these braces forever. Um, that's when bad head angle and teeth angle can develop when they have braces, especially when they have like top braces but not bottom braces or vice versa. Um, you, you're changing the foundation. So if your teeth are lined up perfectly and the mouthpiece fits on, that's great. But when you get braces and then you're like this, it, it's not going to sit right. So some kids will start adjusting their head angles and you've got to stick on them about it. Don't let them change their head angles or their horn angles because of the braces. They have to try to make it feel the same. And they're going to have to search for a flat surface for their mouthpiece. Um, there, it, there is no like model perfect embouchure. Like if your kid plays off to the side and crooked and he sounds good, then fine. Um, but he has to find a flat surface to play on. He doesn't have to look like a million bucks, but he's got to have a flat surface. Um, so the finishing touches. So um, scales, we t we do, we're we kind of scale heavy place. Uh, I think we're in junior high, we do lots of scales. And we teach our kids a key chant. And this comes from my former mentor. Um, he taught all of his kids a key chant. And I got there and I was like, this is brilliant. So these kids are learning things that I didn't learn until I was in college. And I struggled so much with transposition. Uh, trumpet is a transposing instrument. And so we learn our key chant. So like a key chant for trumpet, say our C scale. Um, it would be concert D flat key of C, no flats, no sharps. And then we add OMG just because we're silly. Um, but so you just taught the kid, hey, concert D flat, that's a C. So like in my top band, I'll say, everybody play me, uh, you know, if you play a concert G, let me hear you play. And they'll go, G, and I'll go, well, think about your key chant. And they'll go, concert G, G, and A. Oh, and then they, they transpose and they have no clue what they're doing, but they know. So um, key chants all day long, French horn saxophone, they need to learn a key chant. Um, so we do key chants for all of our stuff. Um, we, we say what the flats are, we push our fingers. Um, and then I wrote out here the order that I teach my scales in. I don't necessarily teach my low brass in the same order, but this is the order I teach trumpet. I always start with concert A flat because going to um, going to a C in trumpet world is kind of a big deal. It's monumental for some kids um, and it's earth shattering. So we start with B flat. B flat's pretty friendly and most of your kids are going to be able to at least squeak it out or get close. So we do concert A flat, our B flat scale first. Um, and then we kind of work in that order. You will notice that I save D flat and E flat for last. That's uh, the E flat scale for trumpet and then the F scale. Uh, super easy scale to play on almost every other instrument, but like life changing for trumpet players. Uh, going up above C, D, E, and F, um, you're not gonna have very many kids that can do that right away. So I save it for last and we just, we go for it. Um, I don't go any higher than uh, G or concert F above the staff in sixth grade. Um, I've had some really cool kids that can play really high and like they they always, you know, like, well, how high can you play? And so we'll, we'll play around at the end of class or I'll let them experiment at the end of class, but I don't ever ask them to go higher than G. Um, just, there's just too much to learn and too much to do. Um, mm -hmm. For Trump, or I guess for any of your instruments that transpose, uh, this is one of the questions from the audience. How, when do you ever tell them that they're transposing? Yep, I do. I tell them from the very beginning, I tell them, I said, does anyone know what this is called? And they'll say it's a trumpet. I said, but what's its first name? And they're like, oh, I don't know. And I'll go, this is the B flat trumpet. And they'll go B flat. And I'm like, that's right. Because guess what note I play when I play the trumpet? And they go a B flat. And I'm like, that's right. And then I'll say, and then as they start learning more notes. I'm going to say, well, this note right here, this is a C. I'm going to play it. And then I'll pull out a tuner and I'll show them. But guess what note it's coming out of? And they'll go, C. And so I'll, like, I'll teach them that this is a B flat trumpet. 
and it doesn't speak its well i say it speaks its name what's what's my call what's there always used to say like the trumpet speaks its name it's a b flat trumpet it's going to speak a b flat um and then i'll tell them okay well what note does the e flat saxophone play when it plays a c and they'll go an e flat um and so we'll talk about transposition um I won't really tell them why, like sometimes we might talk about how there's more than one type of trumpet, like there's a B flat trumpet and a C trumpet. Um, but I, I do tell them in that way that it is transposition, but I don't try to melt their brains or make them do worksheets or anything, just to make them aware. Um, other things that I focus on in the second semester, uh, tonguing is a big focus in the second semester. Um, our performing bands or our like our bands that go to UIL and things, uh, we noticed that articulation is always a thing that was driving us crazy, like right as we were getting close to contest time. We're like, no, tongue firmer or tongue in the right spot. Um, so I do a lot of tonguing focus days with my kids. So what we'll do is we'll do all those exercises that we did at the beginning that are in whole notes. And I'll go, okay, well, we're tonguing today. So we're going to subdivide eighth notes. So instead of going G, rest, 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 F sharp, rest, we'll go G, 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 rest. F, 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 F. And the kids that aren't tonguing correctly hate your guts because they're like, oh, you're making me tongue too much. Uh, so I, I do it tonguing Tuesdays and sometimes I'll throw in some fun stuff and I'll say, hey, no shoes today, no shoes Thursday. So they'll take their shoes off and then we'll tongue and they feel like we're doing cool stuff, but really we're just playing whole notes and tonguing. Um, so we do tonguing days. Um, we'll tongue our lip slurs on those days. So we'll go, instead of going da, 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 we'll go ti, 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 ti. Um, so we, we tongue a lot of things um, on those days. And just to get their tongue work. Um, I like to dangle carrots for my kids and push them. So whenever I do chair tests, which we do chair tests um, like bi-weekly, sometimes weekly, um, I'll dangle carrots for them. So I'll say like, hey, Hey, uh, I want you to play measure one through this of, you know, twinkle, twinkle, little star. And if you want, I'll give you five bonus points if you play it at 100. And I'll give you 10 bonus points if you play it from memory. And they're like, okay. And for some reason, my trumpet class, more than any of my other classes, they're like, there's not a single kid that doesn't play it without bonus points. They all, they all go for the extra. There's, you know, maybe like a kid that didn't practice but he wants the bonus points so bad he'll try. And now of course, like some of them eat it really hard and they'll totally blow it. And some kids are really successful, but we're learning hard lessons in band. So I'll be like, you know what? You tried, but maybe you should have practiced more. Or, you know, like, hey, he didn't take bonus points and he played it better than you. Um, but I give a lot of, a lot of just like silly things like that. Hey, if you do this, I'll give you lettuce. Um, lettuce is candy, but we call it lettuce. But I don't know, because we're weird. Um, so we'll tell them like, hey, who wants lettuce? And the kids are like, I want lettuce. Um, so anyway, um, finger movement and physical memory, just getting them to move their fingers and know how it goes without having to look at it and be comfortable. Also with music reading, um, it's like actual reading. Like my daughter, she's learning how to read now. And I, like the, the similarity is just blow my mind. I'm just like, you struggle with that and like recognizing things. And then the same things are happening in music. She takes piano lessons. Um, so you got to keep them reading things. Again, a lot of what I do is rote taught, but then a lot of it is like, read it, read it. And so I'll walk around and I'll make them read it. Um, but you got to kind of battle between good tone, but also good technique. And then also good theory. Like they have to know how to read it. Um, so you got to make it fun, but that's that's kind of what I do the second semester. A typical class structure for me, I would say 30% of what I teach daily is uh, theory based, not maybe not like necessarily without the trumpet. Sometimes it'll be with the trumpet, but I will talk to them a lot and I want them to tell me the answers. So I'll feed them the answers and then for, like every day after that, I'll ask them every day like, okay, well, what does a sharp do to a note? Okay, what does a flat do to a note? Um, and then fundamentals is like 60%. It should be like 75%. But we do fundamentals pretty much the whole thinking time. And I try to make them fun. Um, and then like the book, we use Accent on Achievement is like 10%. Like the last five minutes of class, usually I'm like, okay, turn to your books. Here we go. Let's play a song. Um, and I, I skip songs that I don't like. I don't know if that's allowed, but I do it because I'm like, we're going to skip that song. And they're like, why? And I'm like, because it's stupid and I don't like it. And they're like, okay. And I just, 
I skip some songs in the book that I like that are fun. And I think that's important because the music is fun. Um, I put in the bottom, I said, you can put it in any order that you want. You don't have to go, you know, this goes first and then this goes. You can, you can spice things up occasionally and, you know, tell the kids, okay, today we're starting with rhythm. And they're like, what? We're doing what? Are we allowed to do that? And I'm like, I think we can. Um, so I like to, to do that and just spice up their life. They feel like we did something new and exciting, but really we just did the same stuff, just in a different order. Um, that's how my class goes for the majority of the year. For grading, we do objective sheets at my school. Um, it's paced learning and it's program-wide. Um, it's adjustable by year. Ms. Isaacson, we have a lot of friends on here that don't know an objective sheet is. Can you give a sure. quick rundown of what that is? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's a it's a mixture of playing, theory, and organizational skills. Um, and so for an objective sheet, I wonder if I click on this if it's going to work. I don't know if can see this. We'll see. Stop share. Share again. Hold on, it's still loading. So um, an objective sheet is um, a grade. They get a pass or a try, and it's uh, it asks them to do an objective or a task. And it could be play a G for eight counts. And if they do it, they get a pass. And sometimes kids pass the first time. Sometimes it takes them two or three times. Um, but it's it's just a task. We have every year or every six weeks, they have to have an organized binder. So they show me their binder. It's organized. You have all your supplies. Check. You get a 100. Um, so my I'm sorry. My objective sheet is still loading. But the, we do it every six weeks. And we do a mixture of playing and non-playing. So like the kid who's a really good student who maybe is not the best trumpet player, can get 100. Um, we strongly believe that every child should be successful and success looks different for everyone. Some kid can be successful on day one and some other kids are gonna take until day 29 to be successful, but we still feel like they should both, they both deserve to get the same grade in band. So like the first year trumpet player will get 100 and so will the last year trumpet player, as long as they take care of their stuff. We love objective sheets, this is one, because the kid gets the grade they deserve. Um, so you'll kind of see there's a lot of words up here and formalities. Uh, it says you get a pass, you get 100, uh, you get a try, you get a 50. We take it up to a 70, so if you get two tries, you get a 70. And you'll see the first one on here, it says pass instrument and supply section. And on the back, they have all the supplies that they're supposed to have to play trumpet. And once they have that, they get a 100. Um, and then we make them have a parent signature, progress acknowledgement, and basically the box just says, I understand that my child has to do this to be successful. Um, and then we do alphabet all stars. This is the beginning. And they have to say their ABCs, like that's it, is A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, G, F, E, D, C, B, A. And we do it with like some fun little like beats in the background. And we go around the room and we give them stamps. And once they pass three lines, they get 100. And it's super easy and the kids feel successful and they're like, wow, I got 300s and I, I didn't really do anything. Um, now, obviously it gets a little bit more complicated as the year goes. So they have to clap and count some rhythm rockers, which are in our uh, musical mastery book. And then they have a note naming thing. They have to fill out their note naming in their theory book. Once they do that, they get a 100. Um, so you'll see that there's some theory things and some other things um, on the back. They have their binary inspection requirements. So we tell them what order their binder goes in and they basically just have to make it happen. Um, and then there's their supply sheet that they have to have. So we we try to keep it really simple. Um, oops, wrong thing. So it's my favorite and you can take it and kind of do what you need to do at your own level, but they are, they're pretty, they're pretty amazing um, and helpful and they kind of get more advanced as we go. Towards the end of the year, like this six, six weeks, uh, I didn't put one on here because it's our scale project and like they have to play like seven scales for us, which is like a big turnaround from this, which they didn't have to play anything because they couldn't. So we didn't ask them to. Um, I told you about chair tests on here. We do one um, every one or two weeks and my kids love chair tests. Some people are anti chair tests. They feel like it hurts people's feelings and we are very real about it. We talk about how chair tests are, you know, like somebody in here is going to be the worst at it. And you, it, it is what it is. Like you win, you lose. I mean, it's someone's first chair and the rest of you are not. It's going to be okay. Um, I do teach the line that I do a chair test on. I know some people don't do that. They'll assign a line and then they'll show up and they'll hope for the best. I had way too many depressing chair tests. 
like that. So I like the kids to be prepared. And then, like I said, I dangle carrot. So I'll teach it to them and then I'll ask them to do something a, a lot harder. Um, and then some kids will kind of separate themselves that way. Um, it's always a song. I don't like to do chair test over fundamentals. I do it over a song. So like we'll be doing hard fundamentals and stuff like that. And I'm like, okay, our chair test this time is you know, row, row, row your boat. Um, and then we have a rubric that we get grade, uh, grade them off of. So it's um, based off of tone and things like that. And that rubric gives like mega, super solid points to a solid foundation. So like if you sound like poo poo and you play all the right notes, the kid who sounds amazing, who played all the wrong notes will beat you. And you're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, because that's the way we want it. So we have like the give me box and the give me box is like, your posture, your airflow, your breathing, your tone quality, and they get points for that. So if you don't have very good of those, your score tanks a lot. Um, so that's that's a really solid thing. The kids realize that tone quality is the most important to us. And then let's see if this works. If it don't work, maybe. Okay. Um, and then I put ways to make it fun. You gotta play. You gotta play all the time as much as you can. Talk fast. Uh, be exciting. You are, as like all of our colleagues last week said, you're an edutainer, which I love that. Like they are there to have fun, but they can sound good and you can like value fundamentals and going slow, but you still have to have fun while doing it. I put pacing. Um, I put quick activities, but be slow and engaging. Um, you, there's things that you need to take time on, but then like at the end of class, your kids should be going, what already class is over because they feel like you didn't really do anything, but you did five minutes here and two minutes there and five minutes there. Um, give them a lot of stuff, but like the same material, if that makes sense. Um, I put on here fun jams. I use Launchpad app a lot. My kids love it. They, they're like, uh oh, DJ Isaacson in the house. And I'm like, that's right. And uh, we, we have a blue speaker in the back, our Bluetooth speaker. It's not blue. It's Bluetooth. Um, it's in the back of the room and we crank some beats and I've broken a couple of speakers at our school before because I get a little carried away sometimes. So like we'll put some beats on and we'll just crank it out and the kids are having fun and we'll play along, you know, so we'll go, um, we have fun music Friday. So I'll turn the tempo up like 20 beats or something and we'll play all of our fundamentals, but we'll play them faster. And they're like, whoa, we're playing whole notes, but faster. Um, we'll do Musu, which is not new. Um, method stand up, we'll play games and we'll go faster and faster and faster and faster until somebody wins and then I'll give them lettuce. Um, we'll do book roulette, uh, where this is usually on Fridays. Uh, we'll do book roulette where each kid will get to pick a line out of the book and we'll play it maybe 10 beats faster than normal. And, um, and then I'll randomly pick some lines to be mess up stand up lines. And so they'll pick them. And then if we, they pick the line, then we'll play mess up stand up. And it gives the kids a chance to um, play old songs in the book that they like. It also gives a huge bonus points to those kids that earned the higher chairs in the back of the room. Um, and then we'll do minute to win it. In March, we'll play some note reading games and we'll give them a minute to see how many the whole class can answer together. And then at the end of the week, the class that has the most, like we'll buy donuts or something. Um, and the class that is always struggling the most is always the class that wins. It's always the tuba class. Like they're always the worst. And then all of a sudden they win donuts and I'm like, what? But I guess that's the point. <laughs> I put some links on here to the musical master book. Look, I love it. It's wonderful. Fabulous. You need to check it out. Uh, it's totally worth all your money. Throw your money at them. Um, mini pinwheels. I talked about this um, on my previous session. We do a lot of our stuff with mini pinwheels at the beginning. Um, probably like the fall semester, we're, we're mega mini, mini pinwheels. Um, my Google Drive there has uh, links to all the documents that are referenced in this. And then Van Richter's Talk Shop, um, there's some stuff on there that is just fabulous and wonderful that you should look at. And I think that's all I have done. All right, friends. So <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up the chat. Please, if you have a question, this is the perfect time to put a question. And, and we're gonna to try to let Ms. Isaacson answer those questions here live. So a question about anything at all uh, regarding the, the beginning trauma pedagogy, put it in there. She gave us a lot of great food for thought tonight. Uh, Ms. Isaacson, while we're getting some questions going for you, how important is speed in this beginning of the, the technique 
uh, of the first year? Um, no, I mean, we, I move really slow in sense, but then I really do push them to go faster at times. So I, I kind of drive like an old lady, like, you know, like we'll go really slow and then all of a sudden we'll find the gas pedal and we'll go really fast. Um, so I like, I like to keep it spicy for my kids and sometimes we'll go fast and that's what Musu is good for. Um, or Sun Music Fridays, where we can kind of let go a little bit and loosen the tie, so to say. Um, and then Monday comes back and we're very regimented again, but you kind of have to establish order before you can allow chaos. Um, so we do that a lot. Okay, we got a question here. Um, how do you choose, like, how do you select the kid who has the best sound? What's your criteria for choosing the best sound? Um, like tone quality would be it. And usually you can hear, like you go around the room and you can hear. Sometimes it's like, oh, you have a lot to pick from. Sometimes I'll have showdowns with the kids. So I'll be like, you, 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 and you. I really like you. Um, but I put a drone on and I base it on pitch. And sometimes I don't even tell the kids. I'll be like, you know, that was really good, but your, your sound was totally not in the center. Um, the kids learn how to adjust their pitch without me ever really talking about it. Some kids will need some help, but the kids want, like you naturally want to gravitate to the right note. Uh, so I'm looking for beautiful open sounds. I'm looking for like solid eight hole counts. I'm looking for tongue starts. I'm looking for air stops. I'm looking for no wiggles in their sound. So I'll tell them like, if you drew your sound, does it look like this or does it look like this? Um, so we'll, we'll do a lot of that um, demonstration stuff. Next question here. Uh, how do you fix a real thin tone? Uh, they're not vibrating on the whole mouthpiece when they've been playing like that for years. That's a, pro that's a problem. Um, fixing kids that start wrong is a nightmare. It's so stressful. It's stressful for the kid. It's stressful for the teacher. Um, they, they, it's probably because their lips are too tight. Um, they, they need to relax their bottom lip more. But a kid relearning is, is hard and that would be like some mega work and some diligence that has to happen. And I think that that has to wanna to come from the kid. I've had some kids who've changed their embouchures before, but the kid has driven it. Um, it's very rarely the director that drives it um, because it takes a lot of practice in the, in the room to like on the private side of it, like with the kids working by themselves to get it to work. And it's just, they're too tight. It might be because their top lip, enough their top lip isn't in the mouthpiece because um, the vibration, it comes from the top lip. So if it's a thin sound, it's probably because they don't have enough in there. Um, like they might've pulled down too far towards their chin. And I would just encourage them to push up more. Um, for your seating arrangement, we know that you have a, a unique seating arrangement where you have the kids stretched out all over the room. Yeah. And typically the top kids are in the back. And as you move closer, it's the kids who need a little bit more TLC. <laughs> so the question here is, um, does, does your setup change as the years go on? Does it evolve like as the school year progresses? Um, the kids that are sitting there do. Um, so, so it depends what the chair test is over or what it is. Or, you know, I have sometimes we have falling stars, like, uh, you know, an all star who plays really well that acts like a turd bucket. And I'm like, congratulations, there's a media shower. He comes sit next to me. Um, so we'll have falling stars occasionally. Um, but pretty much all year long, the all stars, all stars are in the back, they're spaced out. When we're getting ready for a concert, I'll bring them all up close and we'll sit together, but we don't sit too close together because we trumpet players, we're trouble. So we got to keep our distance. Uh, we space it out like six feet all the way. This is great oh, Corona wow. practice. <laughs> all right, folks, we're getting down to the end here. If you have any more questions, this is a great time to ask. Uh, we'll give it about a minute or so you can drop your questions right there in the chat. Um, Miss Isaacson, when the kids graduate, so in, you start your beginners in sixth grade, right? Yep. So when they get to performing bands, how do you have them sit there? Uh, I mean, they sit in band setups. Um, we don't typically, we're really bad about doing chair tests when they make it into performing bands. Um, we kind of just let them sit wherever they want and we'll place them on parts based off of what I think is best. Um, but they kind of stay there. They, um, I, I'm a big fan of putting firsts in the middle and seconds and thirds, but if you only have first and seconds, then um, we stack our brass. So like trumpets and trombones are behind. If you have the room, I'm a fan of having trumpets and trombones next to each other, um, just because the directional brass need to be directional in your face, but they sit next to each other. We don't space out once they're big kids. 
Uh, let's see, next question here. What do you do about kids that develop a bad posture as time goes on? Don't let them. You are the squeaky wheel. Um, I don't know, like sometimes like kids get to high school and they like they lose their backbone or something. I don't know what happens. Um, I think make, making them sit up, we take like a clarinet case sometimes and we'll stick it in the back of the chair because the clarinet case is the perfect size. So you can set it up like vertically and sit it there or you can be a real punk and you can put it horizontal on the chair and that much there's just she has like that much room to sit on um which I'm, i am that person so like if you can't sit up then you lose your chair you lose three-fourths of your chair um but i refuse i'm a snapper and I'm, an, I'm really sassy if you can't figure that out and i just i just don't allow it i'll look at kids and i'm like no, no no we don't do that here like no thank you um i just don't tolerate it you can do it with a smile on your face. Sometimes kids look at me and they're like, are you serious or are you joking? And I'm like, I don't know. You'll never find out. Um, so I think just being the squeaky wheel, being the turd, it's your classroom. Like you can cry if you want to. All right, folks, this is our last call. This is the last call. So drop that question if you have it. Um, Ms. Isaacson, last question that I have for you on the sound of the day, best sound of the day stuff. Uh, when do you start that in the school year? Like, how do you know the kids are ready for you to start doing BSOTD? Um, we usually start once we can hold a note for eight counts. Um, once we understand how to start and stop in time and we can hold a pretty steady note, we'll start fairly quickly. Um, I, I, we sometimes do best out of the day without like without acknowledging punk start first. Um, kids will pick things up just naturally based on um, listening to you, but uh, I will, it'll be pretty close to around the same time that we start articulation. So it's pretty quick. Right on. So everybody, that's about it. Let's give a huge hand two sessions from Ms. Isaacson and she gave us some great information. Thank I mean, you. absolutely fantastic. Thank you, thank so, you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, folks. If you have questions, go. you can go over to our website, virtualbanddirectorconference.com. You can submit questions there. We also have handouts from this session and her previous session. They're all uploaded there. You all have a wonderful night. Ms. Isaacson, if you'll stay on for just a second, we'll sure. talk to you guys Thursday. We have a part two as well. And then next Monday, we have the fabulous Jim Shaw giving us a beginning saxophone pedagogy. Ooh. So come out, come early. We'll see you guys on Thursday and then again on Monday. Y'all have a great night.